It's a critical question that we need to ask. And here's the dilemma. The world has all, kind of ans- all kinds of answers for us. The world is telling you who you are. But so often the world is just plain wrong. And we just sang a, sang a song a moment ago, ago where, we, where we were singing, your promises never change, your promises never change. We were singing to God and we were acknowledging that God, when he gives, when he speaks through his word, when he gives his promises, those promises are solid, rock solid. Not changing day by day, week by week, month by month, generation by generation, administration by administration, opinion by opinion. But God's promises stay the same. And what God says about you is that if you come to him through faith in his only son, Jesus Christ, you are adopted as a child. What an amazing thought. That the God of the universe to, to answers the question, who am I, by saying, you can be my adopted child. Just place your faith in Jesus. You become my child forever and ever. Amen. That's good news. That's great. We talked about that two weeks ago. We, we thought about that last week. Last week, we continued this grappling with this question and asking, who am I? And we're going to be doing this for eight weeks. That's about as long a series as Shoreline normally does. But every single week, we're, we're getting into this book, and we're grappling with the question, who am I? I am, through faith in Jesus, a child of the living God. I, I can become a member of God's family, God's kingdom. We can seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and everything else seems to fall into place. Not perfect, but man, he adds the things to us that we need added to us. If you missed the first two weeks of this series, go on back and watch them on our website. They're on YouTube. Get caught up. But today, we're continuing to ask this question, who am I? And our answer is, I am a person who is about the future glory of what God wants to do in and through me. And I'm not, I'm not defined by my past mistakes. And the world says, oh, yes, you are. You were defined by your past mistakes. And God says, oh, no, you're not. Who am I? I'm a person controlled by, defined by, and locked in to the past. Or I'm a person who can walk into the future in the glory of the living God. In the power and the name of Jesus the Christ. And we're going to talk today about the power of God to bring transformation. I don't know where you are in your life right now, and I don't know your past story. I don't know what it is that you would call the skeletons in your closet. I don't know what it is that if people knew it about you, you would just be just be absolutely embarrassed. I don't know. And it's not my business. But I'll tell you this, God knows. He knows it all. And he still loves you. And he still longs that you would come to him and become his child and a member of his kingdom and part of his family and walk into the future glory that he has in mind for you. Our past doesn't define our future. Now, here's a question for you. Would you, if you had a first child, firstborn child, little baby, first time you're going to get a babysitter for that child, would you let a murderous, drug-dealing womanizer babysit your firstborn child? Probably reflects the response is no. Probably that doesn't make a lot of sense. But Sherry did, and so did I. Our firstborn child, Zach, when he was a little baby, the first time we left him alone with somebody to babysit him was a murderous, drug-dealing, womanizing, crazy man and his wife. And you have to know something about this guy. He had met Jesus some years before. And he wasn't anymore who he was before. God knew who he was before. His wife knew who he was before. We learned who he was before. A young guy who grew up on the streets of Boston, street brawler, street fighter, loved fighting. His friends would always try to get someone to be antagonized by him because he would just then take him on and take him down. And then when he had a chance to go to Vietnam, he was thrilled. Because then he could beat people up, he could fight, and he could even kill people. All the wrong motives. Even when war is necessary, that's not what it's all about. But for him, this was like exciting. He actually got limited in what he could do because he enjoyed too much the violence. When he finally got out of the military, came back to the States, 
he became a bodyguard for a drug dealer. Because then he could have drugs, he could have women, and he could beat people up as a job. And he loved it because that's who he was. Drug addicted. Obsessed. Possessed. Messed up. And this guy met Jesus. This guy was transformed by the power of the living God. This guy became a child of God, adopted into God's family. This guy became a member of God's kingdom and bowed his knee to Jesus the Christ and said, Jesus Christ is Lord, and he let Jesus be the Lord of his life. And so then this previously murderous, drug-dealing, angry, womanizing person was not the same person anymore. He was actually one of the primary leaders in our church who managed the church finances. Well, you give your finances to someone like that? Yes, because he's not that person anymore. He'd been transformed by the power of the living God. And if you're a Christian, so have you. Transformed and being transformed. Because God's not done with you yet. He has future glory for you. And if you're online with us today, if you're on campus somewhere today in the worship center, out in the courtyard, in the family worship venue, and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, when you meet Jesus Christ, he cleanses your past and he plans your future. And if you'll walk in his ways, you will be continually transformed till you see him face to face one day. That's part of what, that, that, that's who we are. We are not our past mistakes. We are becoming what God has in mind for us when we put our faith in Jesus. And so I want to think together about what God says, a biblical message. I'm going to, I want to tell you two stories today, two stories from this book, two stories about real people living in the real world who encountered Jesus the Messiah and were transformed. I hope you enjoy stories because part of today what I'm going to do is just tell you a couple stories from the Bible. I'll mostly read it from the Bible. I'll fill in some of the, some of the, the pieces of the storyline. The first story, story number one, is a story of a killer turned preacher. A murderous killer turned preacher. If you have your Bibles with me, turn to Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 7, we see this guy Stephen. Stephen is a, Stephen is a young believer. He's a leader in the church. He's just preached an amazing sermon. And the religious leaders of the day think that he's preaching against God, against temple, the temple, and against the law. What they've missed completely is he's preaching for God in the name of Jesus and preaching about a new living temple of who we are in Christ and how to follow the living God. But they, they miss it, all right? They miss it. So in Acts 7, 54, we read these words. So this guy Stephen's been preaching. He's brought this powerful message, but it's misunderstood. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they heard what Stephen preached. The Sanhedrin was the, the, the high court of the day, the Jewish high court of the day. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard what Stephen preached, when they heard this, they were furious. They gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, Stephen said. Look, he said. I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city and they began to stone him. They began to throw large rocks at him that would bruise and pelt and beat him until finally it would eventually kill him. What a horrible way to die. Stone after stone thrown at him. They dragged him out of the city and they began to stone him. Now watch this. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul, remember that name. There's this young guy. They're laying the coats at his feet. Why? Because he's there in a role of authority. He's not just a coat watcher. He's the one giving consent to this. There's some, he has a role in making sure this is happening. Continue on in verse 59. While they were stoning him, while he's being beaten to death, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. That means he died. That's a colloquialism. It's a term that means he died. And then it says, and Saul approved of their killing him. And Saul gave approval, official consent. 
He has some role in this, in this slaughtering of this amazing young Christian man who, if you're a Christian, you will meet someday in heaven. Who's been now restored and is in the presence of Jesus. It continues on in chapter 8 of Acts, verse 1. On that day, kind of precipitated by all of this, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. It kind of caught fire. People started persecuting the church, attacking Christians. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. Now we're back to Saul. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Could you imagine being a a Christian in that place at that time? And Saul's in town. Now he's orchestrating an official attack on the church and on Christians. Men, women didn't matter. He was out to destroy the Christians. The Christians at that time were called people of the way. He was going after the people who were part of the way, the way of following Jesus. Now jump with me to Acts chapter 9. Verses 1 through 6. What happens between these, that what I've just read and what I'm going to read right now, is the church starts moving in great ways. God's doing miracles. God's working. His people are being scattered. They're bringing the message of Jesus. God is doing great things. But Saul is still on the hunt. Acts 9.1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats. The very breath of his body, the very passion of his soul, was to destroy and kill Christians. Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found anyone who belonged to the way, because at this time many of the young Christians were actually Jewish in heritage, they were still going to synagogue and they were also celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. They still, and and, and so, so if we find any of these people who are now following Jesus as the Messiah, as their fulfillment of their Jewish faith, let's deal with them. Whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now watch this, Acts 9, 3. As Saul neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground. And he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Saul is blinded. He's stumbling to find his way around. Because Jesus has shown up. A murderous, church-destroying, home-destroying, highly religious person who hated the Christians and hated the church and hated the message of Jesus is confronted by Jesus. And I love how it finishes. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And what he must do would blow your mind. What God had in mind for Saul was unbelievable. And here's a guy, if there's anyone that God would want to just, you know, you think, well, God's going to just squish him like a bug. Well, God's going to hold this against him for all his life and all eternity. You know what God did with this guy, Saul? First, he changed his name to Paul. New beginning, new name, new start. He used this guy to preach the message of Jesus all over the known world. He used this guy to write almost half the books in the New Testament. Wait a minute. The person God used to write books in the New Testament was killing Christians, destroying churches, terrorizing families, that's who God chose? The answer is, and good news for people like you and me, because that's the God we worship. That's the God we follow. Who am I? Who, in this world that gives me so many lies, who am I? I am not what I've done in my past. I am not my old track record. I am not my hidden secrets. Through faith in Jesus Christ, when you encounter Jesus and he encounters you, you are transformed. And God can and will and wants to do glorious things through you. That's story number one. Story number two. Turn with me to John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, we see a moral train wreck turned evangelist. Now, there's a real shift here. 
The first story is about a man. This story is about a woman. The first story is about a, a person of power and influence. This is a person who had no power and no influence. The first story is about somebody who was kind of in the mix of all the, the kind of social circles. This is somebody who's a total outcast. What a powerful picture of how God moves in different kinds of people from different backgrounds. Saul, who became Paul, was a Pharisee, a religious leader, and, and he was also, uh, he, he was somebody who knew the law. He was kind of a Jewish person to the core. This woman is a Samaritan. She's an outcast. She's considered a half-breed. But when we look at her story, we, we learn the exact same lesson. So follow along with me. In John chapter 4, and we're going to pick this up in verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Jesus had chosen to travel through Samaria, an area that most Jewish people in those days avoided. He sent the disciples to get some food. He's sitting at this well. It seems randomly, but he's actually there waiting because he's God with us. He's Emmanuel, and he knows this woman is coming. He knows her story. He knows her background. So she shows up, and he says, will you give me a drink? He asks a favor of her. She responded exactly like that kind of person in that day would respond to a Jewish person, a Jewish rabbi. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. That's putting it lightly. All right? She says, how could you ask a favor of me? Your people don't even talk to our people. Men don't talk to women in public. Jews don't associate with Samaritans. There's lots of reasons why this shouldn't be happening right here. And yet Jesus says, would you get me a drink? Jesus answered her, and this is one of the most profound verses in the Bible. If it's never hit you, let it hit you today. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, he says, if you really knew who I am, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Jesus says, you're, you're astounded that I would ask you to do me a favor and draw me some water to drink. I'm telling you, if you knew who I am, if you understood who I am, you would have come boldly to me. You, a woman to a man. You, a Samaritan, a Jewish person. You, a person of moral disrepute to a rabbi. If you knew who I really am, you would come to me and say, oh, would you give me living water? Better water than this well has. Water that lasts forever. That's the heart of Jesus. When you know who he is, you run to him. You don't run away from him. If you knew who he was. Then they have this theological conversation about water. Just for the record, ancient world, first century. Jewish rabbis did not talk to women in public. They certainly didn't have theological conversations. This is a rich, beautiful summary of their conversation. We got a little snapshot. Just a little taste, a little, a little sample. But there's this amazingly deep and rich theological conversation. And then after talking for a while, we pick it up in verse 16. So Jesus told her, go and call your husband and come back. Now he's getting personal. He wants her to know that he knows her. He knows her story. So when she realizes that he loves her and he cares about her, he, she understands it's within her story. Verse 17, I have no husband, she replied. You know sometimes you can tell the truth but not the whole truth? We do, we, I've never done that, but, you know, other people do that sometimes, right? You know, she, she said, I have no husband. She didn't dig any deeper than that. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. I don't think Jesus was wagging a finger. I don't think he was yelling her down. He's telling her, I know your story. I know you've gone from man to man to man to man to man. And now you're living with somebody you're not married to. Then they have another theological conversation. And finally, the woman says in verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah, called the Christ, is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. I am the Messiah. I am the Savior. Could you imagine that moment for this woman? I mean, she's, she's undone by the fact that a man's talking to her, that a rabbi's talking to her. And then, she, then he says, oh, by the way, I'm not just a man. I'm not just a Jewish person. I'm not just a, you know, he, he says, I'm the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He had shown her so much dignity and so much care. 
how could he care about her? I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. That's a hyperbole. It's, it's an overstated. We do that all the time. By the way, doing that all the time, that's a hyperbole. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's regular speech, but, but, but she basically says, you know, he told, he told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? She already is now believing he is. She's saying to them, could this be the Messiah? Come and check it out. Listen to this, verse 30. They came out of the town, and they made their way toward him. People begin to flood and flock to Jesus. And they stopped their travel plans right there. And they just kind of put down tent pegs and hung out and had revival meetings. The first evangelist to the Samaritan people, this group of people avoided by so many, especially in the Jewish community. The first evangelist called to the Samaritan people was a woman whose life was broken and shattered, whose heart was broken, and who met the Messiah. And her past did not define her. But God said there is future glory. Not just in heaven one day. Right here. Right now. If you walk with me. And that's what Jesus offers to all of us. To all of us. So what does God say about who we are? What does God say about our past and our future? Here's some simple truths. What God says is biblical. What God, when you hear what God says, when you know that His promises never fail, and you hold on to His truth, you are blessed. God says, I am fully known and forgiven. God says, I am fully known. He knows everything about me. He knows my whole story as deep as you can imagine, the stuff that embarrasses me, the stuff that I wish was, never happened. He knows the things I forgot about because I couldn't even bear to remember them. He knows it all. And He offers grace and forgiveness and love. That's amazing. That's who we are, known by God and loved by God. Listen to these words from Romans chapter 5. This is verses 6 through 8. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die, maybe. Verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't come to God cleaned up. We didn't come to God and say, look at how righteous I am. Look, how, look, look, look what I did to make up for my past. We just came. If you're a Christian, you just came as you were. Jesus said, I know. I know everything about you. And I died for you. And I love you. And if you're not yet a Christian, and you're trying to clean yourself up and get yourself good enough for God, stop trying. Just come home. Just cry out to him. Say, God, I, I, I can't fix myself, but I cry out to you. I receive your son, Jesus. I call on his name. God knows your story, and he loves you. He offers forgiveness. Biblically, understanding who we are, the blessing of it, we know this. I am loved beyond my wildest awareness and imagination. Our God is love. The Bible says that. God is love. So you go, well, then he has to love me. I mean, God's love. He's, that's his job. His job is to love me. It's more than that. He loves you, knowing you, caring. He made you. He formed you. He's watched over you from your mother's womb through all the days of your life. And his love for you is passionate and unyielding and powerful. Listen to these words from 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Now watch this, verse 10. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is love. What God has done. How God has moved. How God has worked. It starts there. God's not reciprocating our love. God delights in your love. But he loved you before you had any inkling of loving him back. He already loved you. That, that is who you are. 
A person known by God, a person forgiven by God through Christ, if you put your faith in him, a person loved by God. Who am I? What's the biblical way to see this? What, what will bring blessing to our hearts if we know the truth? I am useful in the hands of the master. I am useful in God's hands. He can do something with me. He can do something with you. Look at Saul. Murdering Christians, destroying churches, getting official paperwork so we can go door to door, find anyone who belongs to the way, and drag them into jail, go into churches, go to the synagogues. Anyone who followed Jesus, I'm dealing with them. And God says, let's make you a preacher. Really? This guy? Maybe, maybe God says, maybe I'll inspire some of the books of the Bible through your heart and bring them to the church to speak to, to my people for generations to come. Me? See, we look at Paul, and we see him on the other side of his redemption, and we forget that Paul says at one point, I'm the worst of all sinners. I remember where I came from. I, I understand grace, because I haven't forgotten my past. This woman at the well she went in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day, to avoid all people. When she meets Jesus, she runs to intentionally talk to everybody in town. And they listened. They started showing up. They started going to hear about Jesus. They, they, they looked and said, if she, I mean, she was already changed. She was, she was isolated, avoiding people. And now she encountered people and said, i got to tell you about somebody who told me everything I ever did. And you can almost hear in her voice, he told me everything I ever did. He knows everything about me. And he loves me. Come and see, could this be the Messiah? She was already convinced. But she wanted them to be convinced too. See, God doesn't just forgive us. God doesn't just love us. He calls us. He works through us. You don't understand my past. I'm disqualified. No, you're not. What makes you qualified is if you come to God through faith in Jesus. It's Jesus in you, not you in you. You can invite people. You can tell your story. You can let people see the transformation in your life. God can use you to show the presence of Jesus. Now, now every week we kind of do a contrast. I say, okay, if, if, if this is God's message, loved, forgiven, known, washed clean, given purpose and meaning that you can have a future glory through the rest of your life and on into eternity because you follow Jesus. What does the world say? What's this kind of confused, corrupted message that, that in some settings, in some places in the world, you're going to hear? How about this? You are canceled. Big thing in our culture. You're canceled. Hey, you know what? We dug up a tweet you put out nine years ago, and you forwarded a joke that was inappropriate. You are a non-person. You are canceled. Really? If we could do some research on your life and do a little digging, I think we could cancel all of you. I know you could cancel me. I think we could cancel you. We're imperfect. We're broken. We're sinful. Can I get an amen? amen. Every one of us. Every one of us. But our culture will say, you're canceled. For how long? I don't know, six months, a year, five years, ten years? But that's part of our culture. Be careful that you don't join in that kind of thinking. What does the world say? You're unforgivable. The world will tell you, and the, and the enemy will whisper in your ear, you are unforgivable. What you've done cannot be forgiven. My oldest sister, Allison, before she became a Christian, the, conversation, the last conversation I had with her before she became a Christian, I asked her what was keeping her from becoming a Christian. The first thing she told me was this. She says, I'm afraid that if I confess my sins to Jesus, I'll be the first person he doesn't forgive. She told me that, sitting in her car outside Don Jose's restaurant in Huntington Beach. I thought, where would that come from? It came from the depth of hell. The enemy lies. You're unforgivable. You're not. You're not. Jesus knows all of it. He died for those sins. What does the world say? You are unable to earn your way home. You, you, not only are you unforgivable, you can't even get back to where you were before. You can't get back to where you were before. Well, well here's the truth. We, are, we can't earn our way home to God. But the culture basically says you, you'll never get back. You'll never recover from whatever it was. And if people ever knew that, you would be, it'd be done for you. And God says, you know what? You cannot earn your way back home. But guess what? I'll invite you home with open arms. 
It's the prodigal who comes home and the father sees him in the distance and runs and embraces him and says, my child is home. Let's have a party. That's the heart of God. Don't believe the lies of our world, the lies of the enemy. So how should I view myself and how should I view other people? What should I understand? What do I need to embrace? What does God want you to take from this message today as, as, you, as you look at Saul who became Paul, as you look at the woman at the well? And by the way, those are two stories I chose out of dozens and dozens in the Bible that are the same kind of story. God uses broken people. God can redeem. God can forgive. God gives new beginnings. How do I view myself and others? First, saved by grace alone. Here's how I view myself. I have been saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ and by His grace alone. Not my works, not my actions, not my behavior, not what I've given, not how I've served, not, not, not any of the things that I can do. Doing those things are great. They honor Jesus. But that doesn't save me. I'm saved by grace alone. Listen to these words from Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Grace is a free gift of love, unearned, undeserved, offered by God. Verse 9, not by works so no one can boast. Oh, I got saved. I got cleansed of my sin because I did these good things. No, there's no boasting. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Should Christians do good things? Absolutely. As a response to God's grace. But we don't do good things to get God to love us. That's totally backwards. We receive His grace. He moves in by His Spirit, washes us clean, and then we live for Him day by day, month by month, year by year, till we see Him face to face. How should I view myself and others? I should see myself and other people as a bundle of potential. What might God do? You know, Keith, you led us in worship today, and you've shared your story here before. Keith came to Shoreline Church as a non-believer, coming out of, we'll just say, some naughty behavior. We'll call it that, right? He wasn't living the best life. He led us in worship today. He's a pastor. Could you have even imagined back then? No. But what God could do through you. Some listening right now aren't even believers yet. You go, there's no way. Come to Jesus and find out. Some of you are already Christians, but you're still keeping yourself in the penalty box for past stuff. I can't. I can't get involved and serve. Next Sunday, Sherry's doing a, a class on spiritual gifts. How do you find your gifting from God? And then how do you begin to walk in that and use that for His glory? We'll tell you more about it next week. But, that, but if you've never been in a class, like, get into it and say, well, some of you go, I don't, I'm not going to do that because I don't really have anything to offer. Well, what God may offer through you could blow you away. You, you, you may not know what God wants to do through you, but don't limit what God can do in you and through you. How should I view myself and others as future family? When you bump into people that are far from God and resistant to Jesus, don't write them off. Don't put them in the penalty box. Don't cancel them. But look and say, boy, if they knew Jesus, what might God do through them? For years as I prayed for my dad to come to know Jesus, I thought, God, what could you could do through somebody like my dad? He fought it off until 30 days before he passed away. But what God could do through you will amaze you and delight heaven if you'll follow, if you're open to it. And so then finally, how should my perspective impact my pathway? And if I understand who I am, if I understand what God does, if I understand that I'm not about my past mistakes, but I really am about the future glory of what God can do through me if I'll follow him, how should my perspective impact my pathway? How do I learn and then live into it? Here's a couple thoughts. First, extend grace recklessly. Be a distributor of grace to everyone you encounter. We have become a graceless culture. We as Christians are graceful because we've received grace. And can I suggest that you show some grace to yourself? Sometimes we're our own worst critic. Let the grace of Jesus, if, you, if you're a Christian, wash over you and remember that you've been washed clean. You've been, but, but you don't understand, Pastor, I did it again. Friday night, I did it again. This morning, I did it again. Then go back to the well of grace and drink and drink and drink and remember who Jesus has made you. And if you're not a Christian, His grace is enough. 
show grace to others. You mean show grace to people that aren't Christians yet? Yes, we model grace as Christians. We should model grace. It doesn't mean we agree with everything everybody does. It doesn't mean we affirm everything, but it does mean we show the grace of God to everyone. You know why? Because that's what Jesus did. How do I learn and live into this? Invite others with open arms, open heart, and an open home. Live this way. Invite people in. That's the heart of Shoreline Church. Everyone's welcome. Well, I'm not a Christian yet. You're welcome. I'm not living the way you people think I should live. You're welcome. Our arms are open. But you don't agree with me on everything. You're right. You're welcome. Our arms are open. And our homes and our hearts. You see, this is how we live because this is how our Savior lived. And he calls us to be like him. We bear his name, Christian. We live like him. And then finally, how do I learn from this and live into it? Never, never, never forget your personal history. You don't have to dwell on it. Don't revel in it. But if you're a Christian, don't forget where you came from. Don't get to the point where you don't show grace to others because you've forgotten how much you've been forgiven. Remember where you came from. Remember your own story. And the greatness, of, remember the greatness of God's grace. The moment Jesus showed up and you finally understood, he knows everything about me, he loves me, he forgives me, and he calls me his own. Don't forget that moment. Because you can share that with others who need to know that he's for them too. His arms are open for them too. Who are you? Who am I? We are not our past mistakes. We are not our sins, our bad choices, our crazy thoughts. We're not. In Jesus Christ, we are the future glory of what he has planned in this life and forevermore. So Jesus, this is our prayer. As we close our time together today, we would in the deepest part of our souls understand that you are the giver of grace. I pray for every person listening right now online, on campus, that has received you, that has come to the cross, that they will walk in that grace, that they will hold to your grace, that they will understand that they are loved and forgiven, and they will have the courage to follow you and discover how you want to do amazing things through them. God, you took a murderer and made him a preacher and a conduit for the Scriptures. You took a woman of total moral bankruptcy and brokenness and called her to be an evangelist. You can work through us. So Lord, we say today, here we are. If we have faith in you, remind us of who you want to make us. Let us follow you with courage and diligence. And Lord, we pray for anyone listening today that doesn't yet know you, that they would understand that you are not waiting for them to clean themselves up. You're waiting for them to run to you and to receive your grace. May they do that soon. May they do that today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before I invite you to stand and send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give two invitations. One is today after each of our services, we have a military gathering. If you're in the military or family of military, we're meeting today in the garden room, which is up these stairs or through that door or up those stairs, but upstairs in the corner of the building there, and invite all military folks to come. Sherry and I are going to pop in there and say hi and get a chance to meet some of you. And so whether you're new or long-term military, you can come and join people there after the service today. Also, I'm going to be leading a membership class today. If you want to know about membership at Shoreline Church, it's not a pressure type deal, but we tell you about what we believe and what we're about. That's happening today at 1230 in the Pacific Room over here, the youth room. 1230, and also online. So if you're online and you want to jo join us in that class, join us online, go to the website and get registered for that. And then finally, if you want prayer for anything, if you're online and you want prayer, uh, do a live chat prayer with your host or email your prayer needs and we will respond to those and pray for you. If you're on campus, come inside and our teams are already starting to line up on the sides here, waiting and would love to pray for you, so come join us. If you're new at Shoreline, online, just text welcome to the phone number you see right on your screen. We will reach out to you. If you're on campus, pop by the Connection Center and just tell them, hey, I'm visiting, I'm new. Even if you're only coming one time, we'd love to meet you and say hi. So go by the Connection Center, let us bless you, give you a little gift, and thank you for coming. If you're able to stand online, on campus, would you stand with me? Quiet your heart and receive this blessing as we finish our time together. As we go from this time together, 
and the fellowship of God's people. Would you know that through faith in Jesus Christ, you are made and adopted as children of God. You become part of God's kingdom and you serve Jesus as your Lord, as your leader. And may you understand that you are about the future glory has planned, God has planned for you. Don't believe the lies. Don't live in the past. Walk into the future with Jesus. God bless you. Have a great week and we'll see you back here next Sunday.